so uh, today I'm going to be talking about Lenora Forge and particularly Forge uh, training for debugging and profiling on the Pearl Matter system. Uh, so my name is Rudy Shand. I'm a field application engineer at Lenaro. And um, as Wusan already said, I've got I've put some example codes um, in, in the directory uh, he specified. If you push that over, then um, all the, the demo codes and everything should be available, as well as some, some scripts which will help you to get some allocation and, and to run things without needing to do much manually. What I want to say is that it's probably going to be quite fast paced today. It's, it's only an hour to talk about quite uh, a lot of things for debugging and profiling. But if the pace is too much, then feel free just to ask me to, to slow down. So the other thing is I might not be able to get to everything in the chat, especially if you put your, your hand up just um, because my Zoom will be in, in the background. But I'm sure Marcin and Bo will be helping out to answer those those questions. Okay, yeah, so this is the agenda for today. So I said about an hour on correctness and then an hour on performance engineering. Okay, so to start off with, um, it's a good, it's, it's a good idea to start off with um, what Forge actually is and where kind of DDT map and performance reports fits into that. Um, so Forge is the HPC development solution from Lenaro, and that's kind of like the umbrella term. And un underneath there is DDT, which is the highly scalable parallel debugger, which is able to debug anything from single process all the way to hundreds or thousands of processes. Sorry, I thought there was a question. Um, so it's this, so DDT is designed from the ground up for HPC workloads, uh, particularly around multi-threaded applications, typically MPI or SBMD type applications. And the scalability is both in the user interface as well as the um, architecture. So we look at so when we go to some of the examples later, you can see that uh, you can look at things through multiple processes because the GUI is quite scalable, and you can do this at, at quite high scales in terms of um, MPI ranks and processes as well. So on the other hand, MAP is the source level sample based profiler. Uh, what this means is you you don't need any instrumentation to to get it working. And all, all you need to do is append map onto your application as you'd run normally, and then you'll collect a bunch of samples. And then you can um, have a look at your your program and see the different areas, uh, such as if it's MPI based or bound or CPU based bound, et cetera. And again, this is uh, built on the same framework as DDT, so it's just as scalable as well. And then finally, the last tool is performance reports. And this is um, built on top of, of MAP. So it's just a one uh, page view of performance. Instead of giving up all of your code and how things are looking on the source level, it's just one page in HTML format where you can get some information on, on your run and it can give you some hints and tips as well on where um, good areas of performance can be. So Forge in general is on most of the top 500 systems and it's got a wide user base. So we service people from academia as well as industry. And the, and the main focus of our tools is to be easy to use. So I know there's some, some other tools out there, but uh, they could take quite a long time to learn. And when you really want to reach out for a debugger or a profiler, you don't want to have that steep learning curve. It's kind of, um, it just has to be there and you work with it when you need it rather than having to, to learn it. And in terms of support this platform, so our tool is cross-platform. Um, so we support, um, you know, Intel x86-64 as well as ARM and on top of that, uh, Rockham AMD GPUs as well as NV NVIDIA G CUDA GPUs. So as um, Perlmutter is 
using AMD G uh -huh. CPUs as well as the NVIDIA GPU. It should just support that as well as a whole range of um, operating systems and MPIs and compilers on top of that, as well as a range of, of languages such as C, C++, and Fortran, and as well as Python as well. So um, if you have, so examples should just work and be kind of cross-platform if you're using them on other systems as well. Okay, so just going to some of the highlights. So this is not a com complete list, but it, it at least gives some kind of highlights of how you'd isolate bugs at very large scale. So the first one is trace points. And this is kind of like a scalable print statement. Uh, and what that means is it gives the ability to output variable values onto the user interface uh, in a scalable way. So looking at things like spark lines. Um, and this allows you to observe the progress of the program as it's busy executing. And then if you can see that there's some kind of outlier within the spark line, you can hold your application, investigate around that and, and see if, if there is a bug there. So the spark line is the, um, you can see those, the squiggly lines on the print alternative. And what it's saying is on the X axis is the amount of processes that you're connected to. And on the Y axis is the value of a particular variable. So you can see how that variable is distributed across all of your processes. Uh, the second highlight is watch points. Uh, so, uh, this holds execution depending on the value of an expression. If you think about breakpoints, breakpoints kind of look at um, halting at a particular location. So the location could be a line or a function, whereas watch points, they halt when, for example, a variable contains a particular value or it's is reached a th threshold of a particular value, it, it will halt execution. Um, and then another one is static analysis. So my background is in quality and I quite like um, code being quite nice and compact. And especially when you share code around other other um, people as well, it makes it more readable. And a lot of the times, something like a static analysis tool will tell you that there's an issue before it actually becomes a, a proper issue at scale. Okay, then finally, there's there's memory debugging. Um, so if you enable memory debugging in the tool, it will look at things like um, uh, being able to detect outside of a defined memory range. You can also look for memory corruption as well as corruption on the stack and memory leaks as well. But you have to enable this. And I'll talk a little bit later as I go to, through these examples of um, the kind of things it catches and what you set to be able to catch them. So as there's not much um, time with, with some of the hands-on, I, I thought it's probably good to explain some of the GPU memory debugging here. So, so with the examples, we're going to be going to connect to an actual, um, the A100 GPUs, but it, it's a lot different than CPU debugging. So it's probably good just to start with a slide and then when we get onto the hands-on session later, it should make a little bit more sense. Um, so just like CPU debugging, the user interface for GPU debugging should look exactly the same, and you can hop through code, etc. And you can also debug um, the GPU code as well as the CPU if you've got mixed language. Uh, yeah, so the main difference is when you're in a GPU kernel, the GUI will um, provide additional tabs. So one of them is the kernel progress view, You'll have the GPU um, devices tab, as well as this matrix of all, all the D GPU threads. Um, and the reason for that is because, especially with NVIDIA GPUs, uh, they work on an execution unit called a warp. And within this GPU, uh, that consists of 32 threads. So if you step, you're stepping into a lock thread of 32 threads. And so you can't 
step through each thread individually. You have to step that 32 um, as a chunk. So that's the, the, the first difference. Uh, the second one is when you actually press run, it's going to run all of your your threads and when it halts on a breakpoint, all of your threads on the GPU will halt. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so to enable GPU debugging, so especially around the NVIDIA NVCC compiler, you have to compile it with minus lower case G and minus capital case G to give you all the debug information that the debugger can use to actually debug that. And on Perlmutter, you have to um, load the program environment, uh, the NVIDIA programming environment first. And the second, and the other thing as well is you have to run this through the GPU batch node. So um, all the CPU code, you go through the CPU batch node, but if you're doing GPU debugging, there's a specific GPU batch node to go through. So this uh, kernel progress view at the bottom, this allows you to So this allows you to look at um, all of your, it looks at the, the progress of all of your uh, GPU threads. So what the progress bar is actually trying to say is it's a projection of the, um, the GPU threads or the, the thread in the indexing system across all, your, all of your GPUs as a, a straight line. So if you click through that progress view, you, you can, you're kind of clicking through the GPUs and it's giving you all the threads. And then you can kind of debug around that. So when it's green, it means that all of the threads on the GPU are active. If it's white, it means that there's, um, you know, in, inactivity in, in that particular area on the GPU. And the inactivity could become uh, because something's just not being run um, on that particular area or it's just not scheduled to run. Is it, so one thing we, we're not going to touch on today is, is is Python debugging. So I thought I'd give a, a slide on on this. So um, when I go through examples, we, we go through C, C++ and, and Fortran. And everything you can do in those languages, you can do with Python as well. So we support spark lines, trace points, MDA view, mixed language support as well. So we've got C as well as Python. That will be supported. And then we also have uh, improved evaluations. So you can do things like matrix objects, array objects, and you can all see this all within the uh, debugger. And finally, there's very much Python specific um, things to, to to debug, such as, you know, if you in a Python exception and there's, it, you want to stop on that, then the debugger will stop it in the Python exception. You can also look at f-string variables as well as supports MPI for Py, NumPy or, or SciPy, which is all the numerical libraries in Python. Okay, yeah, so, so that's all, all the slides, so we can jump into the the hands-on. So this is pretty much just repeating what Wusan already said. Um, okay, so I'll be using this one over here to get some in interactive sessions, but in the scripting folder, so in the Lenora Forge training, there's a scripts folder that contains all, all of the scripts due to get some allocation on Bill Mutter. Uh, what I'll say is that there's a couple of paths, simple path and mlt path. If you if you just put those paths to wherever your your um, scripts are on your um, home drives. So mine's just in, in in my user drive, but yours might be in a different location. So just change those two paths to wherever you you tar that um, examples. Okay. Can you see my, my, my console? Okay. Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, so if you have this Lenora Forge training or targe on the GZ.
Okay, so it should provide this folder. And if you go into the correctness folder, so the first thing we want to do is just make sure that the debugger is connected okay, with whichever um, communication channel you're using. So if you look into four files, uh, So this is not actually connecting to anything physical. This is just does uses GDB and it and it, it bombs out the application to to produce a couple of, of call files. Um, so you don't have to load anything. It's just using the default modules on Perlmutter. So if you just make in this folder, yeah, make minus F or make file. Okay. So what it's doing is is just loading up GDB and breaking the application. So you can see it's got a couple of core files here. And then what you can do with, with DDT, so I've already connected to Pulmata Pul here, uh, but if you click on Lenora DDT and you can see open core file, then we need to find that core file that's on, on the system. So, so while that's loading, so core files are supported in, in DDT for both NVIDIA GPUs as well as uh, CPUs. So you can see you have two processes have, have pretty much failed and produced the, the, this core file in the CPU. And what I can do is I can load that core file into DDT and I can see around the core, core file, I can see all the processes that um, it was used to connect to. Uh, you can see- hey, Can you make it uh, a little bigger? I mean, the font? Oh, that's a good point. Yeah. That's, um, yeah. Thanks. Okay, I think what I need to do is just end the session first. Uh, there should be something There we go. So you go help, then you go options, and then there should be code viewer. So I can make the font size something like, I don't know, let's double it, 26. Uh -huh. Yeah, so so that's work. But actually, the font side, hopefully, the um, everything else is okay. Um, so I so said, what you can see is you can see the stack of this of this file, and it's gone to uh, this print fraction function, which is over here, and. It's failed. You can also see for each one of these processes, you can see the the local. So numerator is one, denominator is is zero. Just give me a sec. Yeah, I'm not sure what what's happened to my my DDT there. It's just disappeared. Um, yeah. Right. Sorry, I've got to 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 reconnect from that. But um, at least if you can get that far, what you can see is you can load a core file, and if you click on that. Um, 
exclamation mark what's kind of happening is it tells you that there's been a um you know you, you you're trying to divide by by zero uh, which is the the static analysis that that's at play okay so i've got to reconnect you i think i accidentally closed it so if i bring to matter Seven. But at least if you get that far and you can put in a, a core file, then um, you know that the connection is working between your client as well as the um, pull, pull matter itself. Okay, so the next thing we, we can do is we can go into the debug folder. So this is where we, we, we actually debugging, and then you should just be able to make to run make yeah. So to get an allocation, you can run with with this one. Yeah. So th this should all be in the slides, anyways. And if you run that, you can get an allocation. And then you can run. There we go. So if you run DDT minus minus connect, S run minus N four simple. Uh, so you need to module load four trust. There we go. So what should happen is you get this connection up and running. So this example, when you run make it, it already puts into a minus G and minus O zero compiler flag. So if you you were debugging any application, you have to put those flags in uh, so that the debugger knows, and um, you can get enough debug information for the debugger to debug around those um, different areas. Okay, so we run that. Let me re remove his breakpoints. So we can do so. Um, what happened there was when when DDT connected, uh, it, it used the MPI debugging interface to get all the all those four processes are connected with into a common um, location within the user code. So where it's put all of these four processes in is line seventeen. Um, and then uh, what you can do is just as a normal debugger, you can you can press run, you can pause the application, you can step into, step over, so step over or um, step out of a a particular uh, function. So you can see uh, on on the stack view, um, all these four processes are on simple C seventeen. So so what the debugger tries to do as much as possible, and where this is uh, differs from a normal. Um, single process debugger is that all the information is aggregated. So if you go around um, distributed uh, processes, the stack should still be exactly the same. But what we can do is if you click on process, uh, process zero, and if you click just over that, and then go back into all the processes. So what I've done is I've just stepped one particular process And then go back to group. And what you can see now is that three processes are on line 17 and one process is on line 18. So I've just literally stepped one. And then you can see that aggregation has, has shown me that there's an outlier uh, between, between the stack. If you're running this across um, 
large amount of, of processes, then you can see, well, some of them are in this area of the code and some of them is off in a, a, a different area. Um, so along with that, we, 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 we can have the input output. So anything that's done through these print statements will be printed here. You can set a couple of breakpoints. Uh, so if I add a breakpoint and I want to set this on line 32, And I also want to add a breakpoint onto line 41. It's also good, good practice just to put one on MPI, uh, finalize. Um, so once a breakpoint is set, set you can edit it. Uh, and you can see you can set a breakpoint on um, all the processes. So all of your uh, processes will, will stop at a breakpoint, or you can set it onto one process, et cetera, which means that some of it will ignore that breakpoint and others might move on. You can also set a condition there as well. So if I run this and I get to this, this print statement here, uh, then I can look at, at the locals and, and talk about the, the spark line earlier. Um, so we can see on process zero, the value of the rank is zero, uh, the size is four, the target is one, and the source is three. But you can see the values of all the other processes as well within in the spark line. Uh, so what I've done is actually earlier, I've just dragged, dragged and dropped a few things. You can just drag and drop this here to get some, some further information. And I've dragged and dropped the source, the rank, and the target, which is the the ones that that's of use. Uh, so we go through this code. Uh, what it's busy doing is it's got the send buffer of 42. It's got a receive buffer of zero. So you expect the receive buffer to be zero initially across all the different ranks, which, is, which we can see that's true here in the uh, local stab. Everything's a flat line, then the spark line. As you can see, there's no outliners. This is what we expect and the value is zero, whereas the send buffer, as well as the flash, flat line, but everything is 42. Um, okay, so when it sets up the rank, what's happening here is for rank zero, uh, it's got a target of one. Actually, a, a better way to, to look at this is if you right click on the target and you say compare across processes. So you can see process zero, for the target is sending it to uh, rank one for process one, it's sending it to rank two for process two, it's sending it to rank three. Um, so it's kind of like a bit of a, a, a round, round robin. Each, each rank is just sending it across to one, um, to one process ahead. And then likewise, we look at the source, we can compare across processes. So for process one, it's, it's receiving it from one behind. Um, so one will receive from zero, two will receive, receive from one, uh, three will from two and zero from three. And we can see that that year just as a visual guide. So we can see that this is what we kind of expect. Okay, so if we run that, uh, what we can see now is across all of these different processes, this, uh, this receive buffer is now uh, 42, so it was zero, but now because everything has been sent to each one of its its ranks um, and, and send it to the other ones, and we can see that everything is updated to 42. So everything has, has sent it to, to, to the right place, um, which is okay. what, what we expect here. Uh, so everything that all the steps that we've done is in this logbook. So if you did come across a bug, uh, you can look at it here and say, how did you reproduce it? And you can you can export that. So you can just go through all the steps again in case something um, wasn't as expected. Okay, so, so that's a, a, a simple example, uh, just to kind of get used to the, the GUI, et cetera. So if I end that in that session.
Okay, so what I've done in the script, so if you go to room submit script or job, so I've kind of done everything we've just done through the GUI. And what DDT has is this offline mode. So what I've done is I've got this um, running that exact same example, but through a job script. And then I set a breakpoint on line 32 as well as line 41. So this is kind of automating exactly what I've just done. And then I can just dispatch submit this job uh, I've got something else running I'm not sure that one is uh, ah it's my inter interactive session that's that makes sense Okay, so as that run is created, this offline debugging.html file. And what it looks like is this. So that DDT has created a re report for me, and you can kind of look down in each level. See so on line 32, this um, receive buffer is zero, and you can see through the spark lines. Um, seeing it set up as I expected by looking at that code. Um, and the send buffer is 42. And then when I get onto the next breakpoint, what happens is this receive buffer is now 42. So it's not exactly what I expected to do, but instead of going through the GUI to confirm that I can just use the offline tool to kind of debug that they can put this onto a CI system and read through this to um, verify some, some results. Yeah, so let's just make sure I've, I've killed the session. So okay, so just exit that, and that should kill that allocation, which is good. Okay, so. Going on to a little bit more complicated example, what it can do is just go through the, the DDT GUI over here. And what I can do is I can search for uh, performance. So correctness, and I can search for this um, debug and, and looking at this this deadlock example, but actually it's, it's probably a good idea just to show what's happening here. So this is a general case what happens when you're doing some, um, some programming. So, so if you run, oh, so I need an interactive session first. And so what's happening here is I'm running S run in the allocation and you can see this application is just not doing anything. I expect it to return within a few seconds, but it's literally just hanging. And this is a typical issue when you're um, writing um, HPC type applications, especially when there's lots of MPI ranks and um, a deadlock could, could could easily occur. Um, so the question is, you know, how do you de debug this and how do you kind of see what's what's going on? Uh, so what you can do is you can hook up DDT to this application. So we run this deadlock application and we run this with 32 processes. 
the the difference here is I'm going to uh, submit this to a queue. So within that scripts folder, there's a, a queue allocation. Uh, but this is set to GPU. If I set this to the CPU. And the reason why I'm doing this through a queue out through through this uh, script here is because I can um, restart the session and I can I can fix up the code and just keep restarting the session. Yeah, which means I can I can develop with 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 DDT without having to get a, a new allocation every time. Um, yeah, so what I'll do is also enable memory debugging. You can see I've connected with 32 different processes. And as I just run this, you can see what's happening is it's replicating what happens when we run this uh, without the tool. But the difference is we can pause that there and we can actually see what's busy happening. Um, and again, with, with the stacks we spoke about earlier, you can see 31 of these processes are on line 39, which is down here doing this MPI receive. And one of the processes is here yeah, trying to do a MPI uh, S send, which is a, a blocking send. But the difference here, the reason why it's deadlocking is because S uh, send is assuming that when it hits the um, the buffer on, on the other end, that it will acknowledge that it's returned something uh, before it goes off and, and, and resends. Where on the other hand, this MPI receive is waiting for something to send it, uh, for it to receive something before it, it it can carry on. And this is a, you know, a a standard deadlock, and so nothing's being sent and nothing's actually being received, or in the buffer for um, the the code to to progress. And and. One thing we can do to to fix this is to instead of being a blocking send, uh, we can do a non-blocking send, which frees frees everything up. Okay, so now I made the code change. What I can do is I can save the source file, and then I can um, build it. So you can see it's made make into this folder. Yes, I've, I've rebuilt everything. Uh, and then I can restart the session. It is a bit slow connecting. I think it's just quite quite far away. Um, so as I said, I put a break button on NPR finalize, which is usually a good thing to do uh, when you're debugging, just to to hold things and make sure things are okay before you move on. So if I run that, uh, you can see it's it's now fixed. Um, so there's nothing blocking. So if I go run that in in S run now through a through a allocation, it shouldn't block. Okay. Um, so the next thing that I can touch on is because I enable memory debugging, I can look at this current memory usage. And you know, from the first thing you can see that this is is doesn't seem quite right. I expect memory to be used across all different processes. And actually this is using quite a lot of memory. It's using uh, 3.97 gigabytes on rank zero. So this is completely unexpected, but what DDT memory debugging tool actually helps you to see an outline. So this doesn't look quite right and it helps you to look into that. Um, so you can see all this memory is being used by deadlock C29. So it relates back to the code. Uh, so I can see a deadlock C29. It's because I've literally just allocated a whole bunch of memory um, 
just for fun, really. Uh, but you can see uh, that the static analysis is actually said that you're allocating memory that's never been used. So even before I ran this code, I could have looked at this warning here and, and just removed it. Okay, so let's save that. And we can rebuild that. And then we can restart the session. So when DDT is restarting the session, it's using the same allocation. So I've, I've set, I think, 30 minutes, which means every time I restart, it's not kind of getting me a new allocation. It's still reusing that same allocation um, until it, it times out. So if I run that and go finalize, I can look at the current memory usage. And I can see this is what I, what I expect to see. I see, I expect to see it to be pretty much evenly distributed and not actually using that much memory. I can see on process one, there's this extra um, memory allocation happening, uh, which is this M MPA request create. So this is probably just process zero, setting up additional um, MPI and things to, to take on that memory. So we close that if we, the other one you can look at is overall memory stats. And you can see uh, you've, I've allocated memory, but I've, I've not done really well in, in deallocating anything. So you can see the deallocation is, is quite low, while well as the allocation is quite high. Um, but for a small application like this is okay. But if you're running this little bit larger application and you're not um, deallocating some of your calls, what might happen is you might, running to a a memory leak a little bit later but because it's such a small application it doesn't run doesn't matter too much but um it might matter if you're allocating more memory a little bit later on and you're implementing a leak so this at least gives you one kind of view to see that um how you how you're allocating memory and how you're deallocating it as well okay so we fixed this code which is which is nice is not hanging anymore and we making good use of, of memory. Okay, so again, uh, I'm going to use an application, uh, which is quite large, but this time Doing a little bit more, more more complicated things with the with the tool. Okay, so I'm not going to run deadlock. Uh, we fix that. Uh, what we're going to run now is the split example. Uh, let's run this with twenty four processes. We don't need to enable that. And let's give us 30 minutes to have a look what, what this program is doing. Let's remove this. So actually, when when DDT restarts itself, it, it it still stores a lot of my my previous session, uh, which we don't really want to do. Um, okay, so if I set a line on break nine fifty as well as on line sixty eight, and then I run this. Okay, so all the processes here have stopped. I can look at the stack. 
And what the stack is telling me is that 12 processors are on uh, stopped on this breakpoint and the other 12 are stopped on line uh, 68. Uh, so there's a big uh, partition between uh, the the processors. And we can find out what, what's actually going on if you look at locals and then you can look at color. And uh, let's view across processes again. And the nice thing with, with DDT, you can see now um, all of these processes here from 1 to 23. Uh, these are all odd numbers, whereas the other partition is all even numbers. So the code has actually partitioned things between odd and even. And all the even ones has gone into kind of one area of the code and all the odd and all the odd um, processes has gone in, in, into the odd ones what you can do is you can create a group from this uh, you can create and create a group from the other one as well and then you can step this group as well so everything in this we just take it into this area of the code we can step so we can step this and there's not going to touch color zero and all of everything on the stacks and all this information in the locals only relate to this group Whereas we change the group to color zero, which is all the odd ones. Again, I can just step all of this and um, the GUI is just going to update with, 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 all, with all of those. Okay, so if I remove these breakpoints, at least we, we know what's going on with this. If I remove this breakpoint and I can run this for a little bit. Ah, sorry, I don't want to run that. I can run all of them. So you can go back to all, which runs all of the processes together instead of going down to an ind individual one. Okay, so um, just looking at, at this code, uh, what it's busy doing is got this MPI comma split, and then based on this calculation here, it's partitioning things into even comms and odd comms. And then depending on how it's been partitioned, it will either go into this code block or it will go into this code block. Um, so, so where I've ended up in 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 the in the odd ones is the sleep, and you can see there's the send buffer. So what it's kind of doing is uh, it's sending a random num number to the buffers, and then it's just going to receive it here. So all the odd uh, MPI ranks, you're just going to receive uh, a random number that's been sent. And likewise, everything in the even comms is just going to do another random and send it to all of the even um, ranks. So what we want to do is we want to e evaluate this buffer so we can have a look at the send buffer. Uh, we can do this only for the, um, the odd comms. So let's look at the buffer for all the odd comms and you can do uh, view array. Okay, so what, what's happened here is because it's saying, because I've only taken a subset of it, but I'm trying to do it across all processes, which isn't going, going to work. Uh, so I can do 11. Actually, yeah, because I've chosen an odd, I think a 12 will work. No, 11 makes sense. Okay, now I can look at this buffer and I can, evaluated a, a, across here. So you can see for all of the um, the buffer in, in, in the odd values, you, you can look across all of the different arrays. And what you can do here is you can also um, just search this as well. You can search the, the buffer itself. Because they show only if, and then you can look for any values that's above a particular value, um, which will search that whole buffer for that. Uh, you can also say anything in the send buffer is that gone into the receive buffer as well. You see there's quite a few things here uh, which has which shows that anything's been sent has actually been reached onto the um, receive end. And then you can also visualize this data as well. So as you kind of reduce this down and you do some post-processing 
uh, through through this over here, you can visualize what's what's currently there. Um, so because I've only run this halfway, I kind of expect some of these random numbers to not have filled this whole buffer, which is what we can see now, uh, which will be different when I, I run this to completion. Okay, so what I'm doing now is I'm just running this whole application now. You can see what's happened here if I pause this. Uh, so you can see what's happened is uh, one of one of these partitions has hit this MPI finalize and the other one hasn't. So I'll pause the application to see why um, it's hanging and what and what's going what's what's going on. Why I, I expect both of them to to reach MPI finalize at the same time, or maybe one or two seconds. But this is um, taking a little bit longer. And what I can see here, if I take this one here, not this one, if I take all the evens, and if I step through this, I can see yes, it's the sleep two. So actually what's happening is this is just sleeping for a lot longer than the sleep one. So one of them um, will take a certain amount of time and the other one will just double that time before it reaches the end. Um, so you can see if you suspect a hang, you can just stop stop the program just there and then and you can investigate around and see why it's why it's busy hanging uh, yeah we just have to wait for this to finish there we go okay now we can reevaluate this this um this array. Okay, uh, so 12, 11, and 100. There we go. So we can see that this has um, filled up here as expected. Uh, but one thing to, to validate that it's actually doing what we expect it to do, uh, we can actually open two. two of these. So what we want to do is we want to evaluate uh, the send so we can uh, view this array as well as look at, at the receive buffer and let's view this array because what we expect uh, what the code is busy doing is everything in the send buffer should actually make its way to the receive buffer theoretically Hey, Rudy. Yep. So we have a question in the chat window that didn't go into the GDoc. Would you mind just answering that on audio? Okay, sorry, one second. Where's the... Uh, here, I can read it for you. How would you know ahead of time where to best put breakpoints? That's a very good question. Um... I suppose... Yeah, writing yeah. an answer to that question here. Yeah, but anyway, yeah. please use the Google Doc. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, so one way I could answer that is if you're you're busy running something and it's it's failing. So usually it gives kind of a a the, the compiler would say which kind of areas it's it's busy failing in. And so you can work that back and it says busy failing in this area. Maybe if I put a breakpoint in that area or a little bit before that area, um, you can run to the breakpoint and then you can evaluate the program. Um, and step through it until you reach that point. And then you can look around the um, the variables and you can look at different buffers, et cetera, to make sure that they are doing what you expect. And even look at the, the, the memory as well uh, to make sure they're all what you expect before it, it, it crushes. But sometimes, you know, if you're debugging, the point where it actually crashes could be a long way before the, the point where it's actually caused the error. It could be maybe 
Um, you know, if you, if you step back in time, maybe 20, 30 steps behind. Um, so it's not an easy thing. It, it, it just it, it just depends on what the kind of failure is uh, as well. And if you're stepping just one before and you're not finding it, maybe step a couple of um, even further, even further back until you can find the point where it, it's caused that failure. Oh, yeah, I, I I don't have much time there, so I'll I'll skip this bit. But what you can do is you can put these two uh, together. Uh, let's just run this through quickly. So one evaluate that. So eleven, one hundred. So that's the send buffer. This is the receive buffer. We'll get to one hundred there. One thing you have to be careful is you, you don't put a equal, if you put an equal size, then what DDT will do is it will literally overwrite the whole buffer. So you have to make sure you do equals equals. Uh, okay, so that's the send buffer. So this is all the random numbers that got sent. And then what we can do on the other end is receive buffer I. Make sure it has this value. And what should happen if it's generated a random number a random number and gone from this receive onwards. Oh, I knew it's going to do that. I literally just said that I've got to be careful I don't do that. So what I've done is I've just filled this whole buffer with that number. Um, but anyways, well, what you should see is if you do this, you should see all of these values actually just come across to the receive buffer as well. And you can evaluate a few to make sure that everything that has been sent has been received on, on, the, on the other end for even values. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much, much everything. Um, if you want to play around with the GPU as well. So there's a, a GPU code, which is this GPU ML. So we go. And you can just make this. Ah, so you, you have to module load. So program environment. Let me just get my notes out quickly. This one, okay. So you have to load this NVIDIA program environment, and then you can do make minus F, make file, and we should build everything for this. And it's got the minus G, minus G flags as well. And then in DDT, as we've done before, uh, you can just load this application um, in the scripts directory. But yeah, you have to use this um, GPU uh, QTF file instead. Uh, yeah, so if you do that, you can play around with some of the GPUs. I've already gone through through the slides and it should be everything exactly the same as um, what, what I've demonstrated. The only difference is that it brings up a couple of extra um, tabs and then you can debug through the GPU. So I'm out of my time now, at, at least for the debug side of things. So I think there's a, a 10 minute break now before uh, we move on to onto profiling. Uh, are there any questions? Yeah, then we'll get back at the uh, 10, 10, 20. Yeah, that's about break, yeah. Thanks.
Yeah, it looks good. Thank you. Yeah, so just before the break, um, I showed how you can set up uh, GPU debugging, but I thought maybe spend a minute or two just, just going through this. I think the slides kind of says most of it, but it's, it's good just to have a quick um, just view of it. So as I said, what you have here is this kernel progress view. And as you click here, um, you get into a different a GPU a kernels. Uh, so you can look at this GPU device as well to show which GPU you're on, um, as well as the stack view. So with the stack view here, yeah, you can see uh, which kernels are on this particular line uh, as well as here. So as you run through here, you can see this kernel progress view should update as well. As, as, as we run through. So you can see the kernel, the GPU is quite busy. And now what's happened here is nothing scheduled, which means it's kind of just finishing off some of its its kernels. And you can just click in, in between here to see which kernels are still um, active. And then it, you can step through this as well. But as I said in, in, in the slides, it, it steps in a 32 uh, wharf rather than um, individual threads on, on, on their own. And as you're stepping through, you can look at the, the stack view as well to, to, to see um, any changes that's occurring. And then for each one of these threads as well, you can look at, at, at the local tabs and you can see what each individual value on the um, the GPU is when it's busy executing some of these kernels. So the GUI or, or DDT, the um, source view is, is the same. And if, if you're not actually in the, in the GPU, then it switches back to host code and then you can debug around the host code. But when you're in the GPU, this is kind of the, the view that you get. And it's similar in the way that you, you'd uh, debug uh, your host code apart from um, looking more in, into threads and what, what each one of these threads are busy doing. Okay, so that's the debug side finished. If we go down here to the um, the performance side of things. Okay. Yeah, so uh, as I said previously, uh, Forge is debugging as well as profiling and the two profiler tools is map and performance reports. I kind of the, the point of, of map and performance reports is to um, build like a culture of a performance. So if you say you're busy running your application and you want to make sure that it's running efficiently on say Bill Matter, for example, uh, you can generate a performance report or a map output and find ways of seeing if it's running performantly or not. And you can also share this across um, to give it to, to, to different people as well to see if they can help um, sort of target during different areas of that performance to see if they can have some tips and tricks that could help um, squeeze out as much performance in the application as, as possible. And you could add this into a CI system as well. So as you're making code changes, you can see if that's helping performance or, or not. Um, mainly using the, the, the performance report, which is one kind of visual of uh, your performance across your application. So what performance reports gives is um, various different uh, re reports. So you can look at things like your CPU, your MPI, or your OpenMP. And each one of these categories are, are different colors. So your CPU would be green, your MPI would be blue. 
I think your open MP is just a different shade of green. And then you also have um, different subsets like your IO or your memory or your energy usage, which you can see uh, across your application. The nice things with performance reports as well is it gives you some hints and tips of uh, areas that you could look at. You know, if your application is very much MPI bound and you might want to rebalance things, it, it can give you some, some tips to look at. So where I'd like to start is kind of the performance roadmap. So we talked about DDT and that's kind of look, looks at bugs uh, because it's kind of pointless running your application if at the end of it, you're going to get the incorrect result or it runs for a couple of days and then it's seg fault. So, you're, so the very first kind of stage uh, for performance is kind of looking at bugs and making sure things are, are correct. Uh, the next stage might be IO. So if your application is not using the file system very well it could be causing quite a lot of strain on on the application so instead of maybe doing loads of little um reads and writes um in between your execution you could just probably do a a big write at the start uh, run your application and then copy everything across again at, at the end of it which might be more performant than doing loads of little um file system writes uh, and then just further up the roadmap, you might look at your, your workloads and your different communications, making sure that um, your, you don't have imbalances and uh, your, your code is partitioned right and using the right amount of workers to get the actual work done rather than spending, rather than having too many uh, workers trying, trying to and do all the work um, and then just end up doing nothing at, at the end of it. So you want to have, a good balance there and then kind of going further up the roadmap you might look at memory uh, make sure there's no bottlenecks in your memory accesses and then you might look at cause vectorization the make sure your application has been written to make use of, of vectorization and at the end of it to to verify everything to make sure it's, it's correct and all these optimization changes that you've made um actually has not impacted on the correctness of your of your application so usually a good place to start is just focusing on one thing so you might focus on io and then when you're happy with that you might focus on 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 the next bit it's taking each one in turn you're kind of looking at what might be the low-hanging fruits um, for performance so an example of this is um if you look at a a a matrix multiplication example what could happen is that um, when you have your ijk loops or your, your for loops to do the multiplication actually the order of these for loops do make quite a, quite a difference um, especially in matrix multiplication because that kind of exacerbates this particular problem um, quite significantly so this is some some code and um, you can see if you're doing a matrix multiplication and depending on the order of it, if you try a few things out, you know, you can try the for loop as I, J, K, you can try, try it as I, K, J, um, et cetera. You can see actually the runtime here could have a significant impact. So with, with, with the worst case, uh, it's running 1,155 seconds. And in the best case, when you've tried a few things out, it's running in 177 seconds. And the main reason, for this is to do with um, spatial locality. So if you have good spatial locality, it means that things will be in the cache and it's it's ready to use um, as you're doing the matrix multiplication. If it's not if it's not in the cache, then what the application has to do, it has to go out um, and get things from, from main memory, which does impact um, how your application is run and the performance of it. So this is just one thing in, in one area um, which might improve it, but there could be other things. And it's just about trying different things and trying all options of, of different things until you get to a very good um, confidence that, that you kind of squeeze enough performance out of a particular area before moving on to the next thing. So a map. Um, I said map is a sampling-based um, profiler. 
and it's it's built on the same framework as, as DDT, and it's kind of designed for this hotspot analysis. So, and um, you can see there's a hotspot in I/O. Uh, that's something you might want to focus on, or you can see there's a hotspot in some of your memory accesses, and you can think of ways of how you could um, improve that. So MAPS actually built on a adaptive sampling uh, rate. So as it's busy running and the longer it runs for, it, it reduces that um, sampling rates and it only keeps 1000 samples per processes and the rest it just throws away. And what all this means is that um, if you're running at very high scales at a very for a very long time, it will add a low overhead to your application as well as keep some of your um, your files very small. So you can still move them across and email them across and it's not gonna be gigabytes worth of map files that you you have, but it should be in the megabyte range. So you can also have um, different sub um, metrics, so things like cycles per instruction, CPU cycles, and you can see how this kind of looks across um, your application activity. But as we go through some of the examples, we'll, we'll go through that. So some of the highlights of MAP is it could find the peak memory usage. So you see how memory is being used across the application. You can find a particular peak. And this might be, you can, we see an issue in, in MAP that you might be using more memory than you expect. You could probably put DDT on top of it and do some memory debugging. And the second highlight as well is to look at MPI imbalances because each line goes to particular, sorry, each um, metric goes to particular line. You can see if some lines, for example, MPI send is um, just waiting a long time for and and for and for something to to send back to it. Uh, you can see this in, in map that it's waiting for some of these MPI calls. And you can see there might be an imbalance or if something's waiting at a at an MPI barrier for everything else to complete, um, you can see that there might be an imbalance there. So as well as IO, it can give some nice um, insight into how much IO your application is busy using. And then you know you can come up with strategies or changing the algorithm to make better use of IO. Uh, as well as open MP regions and um, giving some visualizations, you can see some of these memory accesses. So what that's busy showing there is you can see in some areas, the memory accesses aren't that great. And then it kind of dips down and sees that it's improving. So different things you can try in your code, maybe even changing some of the compiler flags could, could help um, in different areas here. Especially around uh, restructuring for vectorization, you might want to restructure your code, and then run with some some additional flags and to make better use of vectorization to improve the performance of your code. So again, I'm, I'm not going to go to any detail into GPU profiling in the hands-on, but it's it's it, you you can profile the GPU just as. Um, I showed how you can debug it. The only difference is instead of DDT, um, you just append with, with MAP. So in GPU profiling, uh, we support AMD as well as NVIDIA GPUs. And you can see in purple, that's the time uh, that the GPU is, um, sorry, that's the time the CPU is waiting for the GPU uh, kernels to, to complete. Uh, so you can see this is a mixed program as well. It's got some CPU there as well as GPU and some MPI. And it just shows how um, all the different ca categories when you're busy profiling your application and how they categorize to make up that profile. And then un un underneath your main thread activity, you can see the GPU utilization where it's where the GPU is mostly being being used and the different areas, and then it kind of just switches off towards the end when some of the MPI takes over. And throughout throughout your application run, you can also see the GPU memory usage as well as uh, the memory utilization. So how well you're busy utilizing that memory. 
Yeah, so um, GPU profiling as well as sort of Python profiling, et cetera. Uh, the only difference is it gives this purple line, which tells you um, how your GPU is, is being used when it's busy executing your application. Okay, likewise, there's Python profiling. So actually the hands-on stuff that we're going to be doing a little bit later, that's mainly using Python and it calls out to some additional libraries. So I'm not going to go too much into this because there'll be plenty of sort of Python profiling. But the important or, or the main point here is that we've had Python support since 19 zero. And in Python, it's just pink. If you're in the interpreter, it will categorize it as pink. And you can see this alongside um, your CPU or any of the MPI calls that your application is, is busy doing. Okay, and, and to profile, you do map minus minus profile, S run, you do Python 3 and whatever your Python application is, and it will just sample it as it's busy executing. So again, no instrumentation or anything. Okay, so this is the example that we're gonna use. It's, it's a matrix multiplication example. And I'll, I'll go through 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 this. So in the same um, Lenore Forge training, there's the performance. And this is where all the, the matrix multiplication examples live. So all of these commands here you can use and then it should um, it should just work. Okay, so I lost my um, my notes. Oh, it doesn't matter too much. Okay, so uh, if we if we run if we make this this Python okay, so what the first we have to do is we have to modulate Python. And this uh, and the, the nurse Python already has you know, MPI for Pi and it has all the all the Python um, things all already installed. Uh, sorry, my computer's just just lost it. One second. Okay, so we can now make this application. There we go. So, so what it should create is a, um, it's it, some of these libraries which you can you can put into, um, to run the, this Python. So just running this out of the box, and you can go into scripts, and then in this submit job of sh. Uh, so previously, I put in these execution commands for offline debugging. If you uh, just remove all of these, what it will do now is it will change it to automatically run. Uh, for for performance. Okay, so we do as much. Okay, so so that should run. And it's going to take a bit of time because this one is in in itself is is quite un 
and performant. Yeah, you can see it's just taking quite a long time to run because it's very, very unperformant, this, this particular application. Um, but as we do some more optimizations and as we look at actually what, what's going on, um, you know, if it's taking two or three minutes to actually run this, you can see there probably is a performance issue and we can have a look and try a few things out to see uh, what we can do to improve that performance. It's finished yet. Okay, so, so now it's finished. And what would happen is because we've run we've run this, so we just look at submit job.sh. You can just see all we've done is run S run minus n Python 3 and this ML path application, which is mml.py. And we just appended map minus minus profile to it. And then in Forge, if you click on this map tab, then what you can do is you can load the profile data. So this, so that map file is actually just on, on Perlmutter, but because we've connected to, to Perlmutter, we can look at the file system on there and you can see it's created this Python um, map file for me. So what's happening here is you can see on, on the x-axis, this is time and is run for 24 seconds. So that's what 24 seconds of profile time looks like. And on the y-axis is what the um, processes are doing in a particular operation. So as I said, uh, this orange is IO, so it's doing quite a bit of IO there. This pink here is the Python interpreter because the code is, is running some Python stuff. Um, in the beginning, it's doing IO and Python, a couple of uh, compute, and then we're getting into MPI with a couple of more Python interpreter stuff. And then at some point, all it's busy doing is CPU um, compute. And when it's finished all of those, then the MPI kicks in as well as some, some IO operations. And then what's at, at the bottom here is you can see some of the CPU floating point operations. So when the CPU becomes active as well as some, some memory usage um, and these are just just the defaults, and you can put extra things on. So we just want to look at all the CPU instructions. You can click on on CPU instructions, uh, which shows um, some some memory accesses. You have a couple of memory accesses. Yeah, especially when it's doing around the CPU side of things, it's doing quite a bit of memory accesses. But when it's kind of towards the end of the program. It's not. And then from here, what you can do as well is you can export a performance report, which tells you um, kind of one um, view of where your performance is. You can see compute, 37%, uh, you spend about nine seconds there, MPI 13. We see there's some IO going on and we're using uh, 2.43 watt hours in terms of energy. And it's, it's run for, for 25 seconds. In terms of this, well, there's two things we can focus on from, from looking at this. We can kind of say, do we want to focus on this CPU part here and see if, if there's anything we, we can do here. So what we can do is click through this here to highlight it. And what should happen is some of the 
um, functions and the main thread stacks as well should update automatically. So in, in the main functions taking all the time and we can see the CPU is actually running this CML lib, uh, which looks like it's a, a C function that's gone off and running, which is not Python. And this is taking up all of this CPU time. And then we can zoom back into the entire application. There we go. Uh, so what MAP is, is also saying is, as well, is um, all of the different areas that um, is taking the, the most amount of time. So, uh, so the one that's taking the most core time is 35.6%, which is this function here. So actually, that's the one that we should focus on the most and, and actually determining what's going on and why this profile is taking so much time here. And then second, uh, as a second thing, look at this, why this is taking 14.4% of uh, the MPI time. So we look at metrics and we can also look at MPI. And you can see um, there's only some sends and point-to-point -point communication being done at this area. And then what, what's happening is that there's just this long MPI call du duration right at the end. Uh, and then we can see from this where it's spending most of the time is, is here. So some, some of this M right is spending the time and some time is being spent on year as well. So I don't think this is the, the main focus now. I think looking at the CPU time would, would probably be the main focus, but I think what we need is, is a little bit more inf inf information. And what, what MAP can do is you could have some uh, perf metrics to kind of look at at different um, hardware counters Okay, so what I'd like to do is if I run with map. And I can run this. So the first thing we, we have to we have to do to get some of these hardware counters into map is we have to install a a, a forge probe. So this is not actually installing it physically, it's just taking some information from the system and getting some of these P PMU event counters. And we can see here that um, it's created this file locally for me. Okay, so if I close this profile, I can now use map to say profile. And I can look at here the, the perf metrics. So if we go details, this is everything that, that that's available on on pull button because I've installed which one was it was a 38 just double check 32 probe there we go 32 and this is everything that's available and you can filter through this you can look at some cache and what I'm quite interested in is some of the the cache misses but there's a whole bunch of different um, metrics you, you can use. Okay, so one that I'm interested in here is this cache miss. So if I move this across, you can see this command line option here updates. And I can just copy and paste this. So going back into the submit job.sh. Here on the profile. And I can do that. Okay, so what's I going to do? It's just going to run and it's going to have a look if if there's anything um, we can do in in terms of cache misses. You know, how, how well is the cache doing? Is there is there enough information in there to to be performant or 
Um, is it not making very good use of the cash? And there's certain things we can do then, or at least go on to to have a look. Okay, so as this is running, I might just have a look if there's any any, any questions. Um, I'll probably just just take questions on online. Yes. So does map support profiling and arm systems? Yes. Um, yeah, so the interesting thing is that um, Ford was actually owned by, by Arm at some point um, about a year ago, and um, they kept us cross-platform, but at the same time, the, you know, we, we focus on some of, of, of the Arm things like the Gravitons and um, the A64 FX as well. And even now, the with, with the Grace Hopper, you know, one bit Grace and the other bit Hopper, and we still support that system. So very much um, profiling is, is, is supported on ARM, and debugging is supported on ARM. We don't really say we don't support one better than the other. We just support pretty much everything. Okay, so that's finished. Okay, so now it's created the second map file. If I look at that. Okay, so what map has done now is got this Linux perf CPU events. And now what I can see here is cache misses uh, along this year. You can see, well, actually that, that's quite a lot of cache misses there, 123 uh, million events per second, which is quite high. Um, and as alluded to in, in the slides, and cache misses usually means that there's um, not good um, spatial, locality and it's probably going off to main memory and maybe we can look at what what the memory is doing here as well so memory memory usage you can see around this area where the cache is not being utilized very well there's quite a high memory usage so this is kind of alluding to the cache is not being used very well which means the program is going out to to main memory and um, one improvement we could potentially do is to improve this. Okay, so. If you go to performance, and then we actually look at what this Python script is doing. Then uh, there's like a make file. Uh, this one. Yeah, so what it's busy doing is it's busy calling the C, C library. This is just some library that um, was created. It's, it's obviously very un, unperformant. And the question is, can we um, make this a little bit more performant? Um, so if you look at what, what this library is, it is nonlib.c. Okay. Yeah, so it's it's calling this function over here, and within here it's got all these different for loops. And um, what we can do is we, we can try just changing the ordering of these for loops and see if, if it's making a, a difference. So I've actually cheated and I've got something here that should be more performant. We might not see it straight away without some additional optimization flags. Uh, but I know that if I change this for loop, this, 
and just moving this up, up outside of it should be more performant. Let's just double check. No, that didn't do it. There we go. And then paste that in. That's better. Yep. Okay. Let's see if this compiles at least. Okay, so let's make this clean and let's rerun that just with a different change in some of the for loops. And hopefully that builds okay. Yep, that seems to have I've done it. And this might not do the performance straight away, but we can at least see if 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 there's a uh, a difference. Scripts. Okay, and then S batch. Okay, then while 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 it's busy running, I can take a couple of more. Um, should we use the video compiler? Yeah, I'm not sure if you need to use GUP with an inhibitor compiled. I think, um, as Wusan says, if you use the NVCC minus one as help, it should put you into the right direction if, if you should use it or not. Um, but I've only ever used the minus G and capital G, and that seems to have worked okay. We'll see what this come comes back with, but at least the um, the the cache misses should have improved. Okay, so that's finished. Okay, let's push this report into a performance report as well. So what the performance report should now say is put this um, cache misses there as well. So we, we have a nice value there as well. Um, low profile data. And now we have this third one here. Let's see, let's see what, what this is doing. Ah, so. Mm, I don't think I compiled that properly, potentially. But anyways, I could I could just move on and move on to on, on to the next point where we could probably put some extra compiler flags as well into that that build command. Uh, okay. CD performance and then pi.make file. So what we want to do as well is to, to try out if, if different uh, compiler flags might help as well. So making more 
use of vectorization, etc. Because currently there, there's no compiler flags that we've used at all when we're busy compiling uh, this application. Uh, so the two that we can use is uh, minus O fast, minus O fast, as well as minus G. Okay. Let me just double check this matrix mold lib dot C. And let me just cross compare this. Okay, so for some reason, this one didn't change. I think I might have changed the wrong one. Okay. That's why it was still giving me that very big cache misses. So make. Okay, let's just, so if I run the script again, so what I've done now is I've just run it with some more compiler flags and I think I fixed that for loop now to give at least the right um, for loop that should help with with some of the the cache misses. Okay. So so while that's busy running, um, just to get another map file out um are there any 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 further questions yeah uh, user is asking about the the color color coding um you know what what colors correspond to what so could you explain that yeah so i mean it, it's it's a bit bit tricky if, you, if you're not very good with with colors as well but um so cpu is green then gpu is purple Python is pink. So sorry, the Python interpreter is pink. And then you have open um you have open MP as well, which is a different shade of, of green. I, I don't think you can change the colors in, in itself. These colors are on... mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so 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 those are different colors. I think the the user guide explains all all the particular different colors. So I had a slide up actually earlier. I can just bring this back. There we go. So this is not all all the different colors, but at least gives some of them. So CPU green, MPI, Open MP is a different shade of green, and then there's um, GPU profiling, which is purple and then MPI. And what I was showing is um like the same is there but there. What type of one is it USB C? Uh, no. Ah uh, yeah. Sorry, I think so needs to go and mute. Uh, yeah USB C. No, this is this oh there we go. Um yeah, but what it's busy doing is, is each category is what kind of area the, the program is doing. So if it's CPU bound, it will um, pin that to, to green, which which shows that it's it's doing some CPU operation. Whereas MPI, if it's blue, it's doing some MPI operation at that point in time. So the x-axis is, is, is time. Um, so if it's green uh, over a particular time, it, it will be doing that. So that should have finished. And it should be this one here. Oh, 
okay, you can really see the runtime has uh, has reduced quite a lot. And and actually, this looks a little bit more promising if I look at the CPU metrics here. Okay, so that's gone down to one point seven five. So actually, when I first ran this, I I, I modified the, the wrong file. So when I, I read redid this again i put the compiler flags in as well as as the modification so if and i export this yeah uh, you can see the, the different things between where we run previously which is 21 seconds um, with quite a high cache miss uh, ratio whereas now we've reduced it down to 13 seconds and um, at the same time as well We've reduced the the amount of cache messages just by changing just by changing that um, for loop around. Okay, and then what we can do now is I, I think that's probably enough in 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 terms of looking at the CPU. I mean, the CPU you can see now is there's not much time being attributed to that. What we've kind of done is we've changed this application through performance by making it more MPI bound. So kind of the, the next place we need to focus on is, 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 is the MPI. So if we look at um, some of these reports, metrics, uh, MPI, so some of the presets, which is MPI. So as I said earlier, what looks a bit suspicious is this long kind of uh, MPI call duration, which is just going up over a long period of time. And that we can see now uh, what MAP is telling us is that um, we're going to functions, maybe this is MPI finalize. where all their time is being spent. So it's being spent just at, at, at the end and just waiting for a whole bunch of things to to happen be, be, before the MPI can 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 move on. What this kind of probably says is that either and uh, there's an imbalance where lots of processes are doing lots of work elsewhere and there's just one or a couple of process or MPI ranks, which is just waiting for them to finish. And you can just see it's just busy waiting. Uh, so you can look at libraries. Yeah, so most of the time now is being spent in this MPI library. And around this one here, which is this uh, matrix A receive. So we can kind of like look at different theories and we can say, well, um, if the theory is that we're just attributing too too many um, threads and, and and workers to this problem, maybe we can reduce that and see see if it makes any difference. Okay, so the way you can do this is we just modify this job script. So this is not actually changing any of the, of the code. All this is busy doing is kind of changing the the system itself so instead of us doing number of tasks uh, per node to 16 because maybe this is just putting too many um, additional workers into it and it's kind of just oversubscribing it and let's change that to four let's change that to four let's change this to four the nice thing as well with, with this particular application is you can change the algorithm. So um, I think we've done pretty well with, with that C um, library, but you can change the algorithm to, to be Python specific as well. So we do minus K and then Pi, which is now using a Python library instead of that, that C library. So we're just swapping in a different library as well. So this batch. Um, And we can just see how, the, how this is busy. Um, and this will make a difference to, to the performance. So I think the CPU we, we've kind of addressed and it's not actually spending that much time in the CPU now, or where it's spending all the time now is in, is in MPI communication. And if we can 
reduce some of that MPI communication and improving that, then we can improve the overall performance. And hopefully that works. I mean, it seems like it's taking a bit of time, but it could just be the system. Okay, there we go, that finished. So if I exit that, so close this profile. Yeah, so the first thing you see is this red, and actually the, the red does look a bit scary, but um, all this is saying is that it's being oversubscribed. <laughs> and it's not saying that there's an actual problem with 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 the profile thing. It's just kind of giving an area where it's saying, well, maybe you're oversubscribed in this area. But the nice thing here is that just by kind of reducing the amount of threads or the amount of workers is going off and and doing things, we've taken this profile down to, to, to 10 seconds. So if we export that into an HTML page, uh, and we actually go back to the to, to the very original, so we can compare this to what was happening originally. Let's make it a bit smaller. Um, so the very first one we did was we were running for 25 seconds. We were running about nine seconds in, in compute. Um, 13 seconds in, in MPI. We weren't doing any vector num numerical operations and we were using this much energy. Whereas now comparing it to this, we're spending 1.7 seconds in compute, so a lot less, uh, a little bit less in, in MPI as well, but we've pretty much halved the amount of time that, that we're busy running in. Uh, we're making some good use of vectorization so by changing those for loops around and then putting some extra compiler flags in there we're actually making a lot better use of uh, vectorization and the nice one is you yeah, the energy right at the end of it so we, we reduce the energy um quite significantly um, i mean this is a small application so i'd say that significantly but we've made a, a a hit there and if you think if you're running this for a very long time um, that energy is actually saving quite a bit. Okay, so yeah, and then we're spending some time in the Python interpreter as well. So how does this compare to the original one? So the original one, uh, we're spending 0 0.3 seconds. Uh, we're spending 0 0.5 seconds, so a little bit more time in the interpreter, but that just could be because the CPU has been squeezed in the sense where uh, we're not running that much CPU, so we're spending some more time in the Python interpreter. Okay. So if we look now at this metrics and then the MPI, you can still see it's busy waiting, which looks quite suspicious actually, because even though if we're running with loads of different M um, MPI threads, then it's waiting. And by reducing that, it's still busy waiting, which kind of, you know, it's indicated that maybe there's a, a problem with with the application itself, and maybe the algorithm isn't isn't right. At, at least this is what um, some of these metrics are alluding to. Um, so what what I can say with this application, I mean, I, I know this code fairly well. Uh, what's happening is if it hits um, rank zero, then that's busy doing all of the calculations. Um, so you can see uh, rank zero is busy doing loads of things in the MPI. And then only when rank zero is finished with it, you can see these different um, MPI sends and, and, and receives going, oh, sorry, only MPI sends going on. So this is sending it to all the different processes to get the calculation done. So everything's waiting here for process zero. And you can see that that's very inefficient to wait for one um, um, MPI rank to to do all the all the work before anything can be sent to the MPIs. Sorry, anything can be sent to all the different processes. 
And then what happens at the end is it, it does all of its calculations. And then again, um, yeah, so at the end of it, what, what, what it's busy doing is it's, if it's MR is zero, so again, rank zero, it's just waiting. Uh, and all the other processes are, are, are just sat there doing nothing until process zero has done all, all of its work, which is what all of this wait here is, is busy doing. So actually what's happening is there's no matter how many different um, or how we try to run with more um, more processes or less processes, it's really not going to make that much of, of, of a difference because the application itself is, is not scalable. So there's not much we can do anymore apart from redesigning the whole algorithm to, to make it more scalable. Maybe um, instead of process zero doing all the work, maybe split this across some of the processes um, so that this first half year, sorry, this first part year is more parallel. And the middle bit is parallel, is parallel. Uh, so, so that's fine. But at the end, it's not parallel as well. Um, so it's not that scalable and, that, and, and that's the problem. So the algorithm needs to change to be to be more scalable. Okay, so um, we have ten minutes left. I was going to actually talk about um, some some of the the Fortran sites. I know I've not touched that much on Fortran. Everything's been C C plus um, plus. So what I actually want to do is, is is just grab some of the Fortran work for the next um, ten ten minutes or, or so, just to show that. You know, it doesn't really matter if you're doing Fortran or or C. The the interface looks exactly the same um, for both debugging and uh, profiling. So the closest profile. Okay. The script we're going to use is this um, matrix multiply uh, Fortran one. So make that. I know this has got some of these warnings. Yeah, I I, I couldn't fix fix them up in time, but they they are just warnings, and it's not too much of of an issue. Uh, and what this does is it creates this ML underscore F, which is um, this Fortran um, application. So again, just in DDT, if we go, um, I'm not sure why it takes so long to switch. It just takes quite a while to switch between map and DDT, which, but I think that might just be the connection to, to pull matter potentially. Okay. So again, if you, if you run this, Not GPU. Okay, so this one is in the performance and multiple.f. So the nice thing with DDT as well, uh, and map is when you change this application, it automatically detects if it's an MPI program or not. So it switches it switches things uh, between. So again, I, I need to configure this to use the CPU uh, partition of Pilmata, which is this one there. Okay, so running with four, running S run. Okay, so I know that there's a, a an actual bug with this application. So if we're going to into memory debugging, I, I know the bug is because of um, an array is outside of its un, its defined range. Um, so what you can do is you can tick this box here, which adds this guard pages to detect out of bounds heap accesses. And generally, the memory debugging feature, if you just use a balanced, it usually de detects most of the um, bugs you you generally find. Um, if you want to be more thorough, the, the issue is that um, you're catching more bugs 
and it's a lot more sensitive, but it probably adds a, a bit of overhead to your application run. So I, I, I usually keep it as balanced and what the, the memory debugging um, options really does is kind of works as a an electric fence. I, I kind of think it does that. And what happens is if your code hits one of these electric fence, it just halts and then you can work around and, and debug around that area where your application stops. Okay. And also memory debugging is supported on GPU as well as uh, CPU. So because we're running a CPU application, it's over here, but it does the same for GPU. Okay. Again, I'm just connecting to four processes. And I know this is, yeah, so this is what, what, what typically happens when you, you go from a profiling application and you try to debug it. Um, usually when you, you profile, you're running, you're running it without debug information. So it comes up with this and say, you're, you're missing debug information. So what you have to do is you have to recompile it and put in all that debug stuff there so that your um, debugger can debug it, which is fine. So in that application itself, what I've done is we just have to remake it really. So make uh, clean. And what I've done is I've added extra flags. You can do debug equals one, which will run it with this minus G and minus O zero. And then again, everything I've set is, is already there, running with four processes. Let's submit that. You just have to wait to connect to these four different processes. Okay. So you can see with, with this Fortran code, uh, you can jump in between um, different functions and different subroutines as well. And everything that you can do in C, you can also do in Fortran. So you have your, your current lines here, you can click into there. Um, you can see this is your, your C matrix. And as we actually run, uh, we, we should see all of the others. Let, let's run this and what's going to happen because I enabled memory debugging is going to tell me that, that there's a segmentation fault, but instead of it just crushing out, um, it at least gave me the option to pause. Um, and it's told me that it's a segmentation fault uh, because of this, this line here. Um, but I, I, I know that it's because of this particular array. Uh, if I do res. Okay, so let me save this. Sorry, the, the clean has just arrived here, so um, it might be a little bit noisy, but we've got five minutes left, so um, let's end the session. So I've, I've, I've re rebuilt everything. Okay. Run that.
and I hopefully when I run this, I can put a break point at the end. You can see that that um, segmentation point is is gone. Okay, so let's put it here at this end program. How weird. So if we run this, there we go. It's hit this breakpoint now, so it's not hit that segmentation fault. Uh, I can look at the locals, and I can look at A, B, and C. So you can see these are all all, all the matrices. You can see A. Um, I've got some values in there. And then, again, what you can do is you could uh, view this array and and see what these matrix matrices are are busy doing, and seeing if the calculations have has been done right. So when you do your matrix multiplication, make sure your your C um, your C value is as you expect as you're multiplying A and B, and you can just evaluate through here and search through here as well. So you can you can validate the correctness of your of your matrix multiplication. Okay, that's um, everything from me. I'm sorry, the, the cleaners just turned up as well. So um, it's probably a good time to to stop. But we've got three minutes for, for questions. Uh, do you have any questions? And thank you very much for the all the detailed, you know, uh, the explanation about how to use the tools. And uh, these are great. And uh, um, nurse users, if we have a problem with uh, debugging your code or using this map code map tool or you know puff report, um, please let us know. We can we can help, and we can if we cannot help, then we can try to get help from the uh, the Linaro experts here. So. Um, and, uh, if you don't have any more questions, then probably we can end here and uh, please, uh, please fill out the, uh, the survey form here, you know, that will help us a lot. So. Yeah. Thank so I, I think there's examples and all the scripts are available in, in that, um, directory, which you set. So they could be used for map and DDT and uh, for anyone using pull matter. Um, if you set the right flags, it will build with the right right debug information. Um, and actually, one thing to add, so the, if I can find it. Yeah, so this is optimizing Lenaro with, um, to optimize the code with Lenaro map. So this is a a, a kind of worked example that they'll be given. It goes through everything that I've done with a little bit more context behind this. So I've just kind of made this work for, for Pearl Mutter. Uh, but if you go through this, this is in, in the Forge documentation. So you click Forge documentation, there's worked examples, and this just gives you information on how you um, can kind of go through what I went through with a little bit more context. All right, thank you very much.